Welcome to Hello Chaos, a weekly podcast exploring the messy and chaotic minds and lives of founders, entrepreneurs, and innovators. Hello Chaos is one of the many resources brought to you by Orange Whip. That's Orange Whip, W-I-P for work in progress. We tell real, raw, and unbiased founder stories and why our mantra is where aha meets oh shit. Uh, Hello Chaos releases new episodes every Sunday, so enjoy. Uh, Orange Whip is a multimedia company dedicated to serving founders and entrepreneurs in affiliate cities through hyper-local media platforms that have been designed to inform, inspire, and create connections that help founders along their journey. Uh, Orange Whip, those hyper-local media platforms, it's a one-stop content hub with fresh and engaging stories, curated calendars, and local filterable resource directories, with, depending on the, um, uh, the stage of the business the founder is in. We've done the hard work for founders in these local markets, so they only need to go to one trusted place to find the local information they need. My name is Jennifer Sutton. My friends and family call me JJ. I'm the founder of Orange Whip, and I'm your podcast host today. Uh, we have Taryn Shear, Taryn Shear, the founder and sparkle boss of TKPR. Welcome to Hello Chaos, Taryn. How are you? I am so great. Can I tell you, though, I've known you a long time. You and I have known each other a long time. Yeah. I had no idea because I always see you in such a professional setting. I had no idea you go by JJ. Like, this <laughs> is my, like I feel like my whole life to this point has been a lie. Like, I had You're no like, idea. Who is that person? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So my main name is, is Johns, J-O-H-N-S. And so I have gone by and, you know, we were talking about name, like very unusual. Your name is, well, I was born in the seventies where I think I had in my class and my circle of like really close friends, there were six Jennifers and the others, it was six Jennifers, four Michelles, you know, in our group. And I've always been, and you know, Jennifer was like the most popular name when I was the year I was born. So we all had nicknames, either last names, but you know, I I have been JJ since kindergarten, first grade. I mean, it's uh, it has followed me, um, but yeah, not really in a professional setting. But <laughs> we'll see. I was uh, working today, so today was a good day. Well, good. Um, now I want to know about. Uh, TKPR, but really the Sparkle Boss. Where did you get that name? Well, so I was probably about five years into TKPR, maybe a little less. Um, I started TKPR kind of overnight, and there, that's a whole a whole different story. We'll, we will get to that. We will get to that one. But about three to five years into the business, I decided it was time to really kind of brand TKPR. And I started thinking about, you know, how do you brand a PR firm? Is there a point to brand a PR firm? You know, we do this one thing and, and was there really a need for it? And, and I started racking my brain and thinking about, you know, color schemes and, and what, how are we, do we want people to recognize us? And I kept coming back to the fact that the first job I had out of college was doing PR for a fashion company. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what I would do to really kind of understand the marketing in the space, I would go into the retail store and mm -hmm. the, there was a woman who worked in the retail store named Karen. And every time I walked down, she would just say, Hey, sparkles. And it just, I don't know why. I don't know how it started. I don't know where it came from. I mean, I can guess because I always probably was wearing something sparkly. It just sort of has been part of my personality for, you know, since as long as I can remember. But as I started to think about it, I thought, why try to manufacture something if I've already got something like you look around my office and it was already sparkly and it was already pink and sparkly. And I just thought, <laughs> why don't I just go with what I've always been? You know, my, when I lived in the sorority house in college, my whole side of the room was pink. My poor roommate who's like Italian fashion, everything is black and my whole room like just pink. Everything was pink. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I just kind of adopted that and, and just took it and ran with it and kind of had fun with it. And just, you know, I, I continue to say 
something like saying I'm the sparkle boss and, and we are the pink sparkly headquarters of TKBR, that can blow up in your face really fast if you aren't able to actually deliver on the results. So right. something, something not so serious, you have to be able to deliver the serious work to be able to stand by that. But I, it, it's kind of taken on a life of its own and it's just really fun. You know, what we do, luckily for us, most of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is really fun. So it really fits in with what we do anyway. Yeah, because you guys, uh, TKPR, it's a lifestyle PR firm. We are a lifestyle PR firm. And at this point, we are entirely in the travel and hospitality industries. When I started out, it was a little different than that. But we made a really concerted shift over the last 10 years or so to really just focus yeah. on the travel and hospitality space. It's kind of our sweet spot. And, and we don't do crisis management. I mean, we really, we get to tell the great stories of our destinations and the resorts and just the fun stories and, and the food and wine it's festivals. It's a fun category. It really, there's my <laughs> bad days are travel. And <laughs> my bad days at work are better than most people's good days at work. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. So, okay, I got to ask you. So your name is Taryn Shirt, but it's TK. So where's the, where's the K? So it's not my business partner. It is because I was 24 years old when I started the business. Okay. I actually, um, it was pre-marriage. So it was pre-marriage. It was, I, um, had actually moved to South Carolina with my now husband. Um, but the company I was working for in New York doing fashion PR for had said, it's fine if you want to continue working for us, but not as an employee. So they basically made me a deal when I told them I was moving to South Carolina that I could essentially go as a remote unemployee in translations, if you start your own firm, we'll hire you. And so I, I mean, I was so green. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what a tax ID number was. I, I knew nothing. I had never wanted to, to run a business or own a business or I, I mean, I was only two years into the PR industry in general. Um, but it was an opportunity and I jumped on it. And so literally overnight I came up with TKPR and, and if it was close enough, I would show you the, I keep it in my office just because it's, it's so charming, I guess, for lack of a better word. But I mean, I literally went into Word and and found a, a fancy font and created a TKPR logo out of font and Word and just like slapped it on my door of, of my office. And, and that was that because I, I had no idea what I was doing. And I knew nothing about branding and nothing about running a business. But it was it was kind of sink or swim. Right. Well, that and that's a great opportunity. You're right. A lot of people don't get that opportunity. Um, and it, it was honestly handed to me. It, it, was, it was a total luck moment. I, I look back and, you know, you think about every decision that you made and what got you to where you are. And I don't know that I would have ever started my own business had that not literally dropped into my lap and said, you can keep your job, but not keep your job. And it, it right. was... It you, was, we'll, you keep your job, but we'll hire you as a contractor. Exactly. And I mean, I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't even know where to find a contract. You know, this was still like early internet days. So you couldn't like yes. Google, where's a sample contract? Like that wasn't an option. You're like, I'm going down to the library to go and uh, find out. <laughs> now so, I'm really aging myself now here, but it's true. Like uh, you, you kind of had to use your real life resources to figure this stuff out. Like there weren't, you couldn't just find the answer on Google. So what, so what led you to go, to go from, you know what, I'm going to create a business brand versus just being a, a contractor employee, you know, a solopreneur employee. So well, the difference yeah. from day one to day two was day one was in my mind, keep my job with this company. And then I called a woman that I had met up in New York at a number of other events and she owned her own PR firm. And I called her and actually asked her for the favor and said, do you have a contract that you could send me? Because I have no idea what I'm doing and I, I, I want to protect myself with this client. Right. And she was the one that said to me, so you're going out on your own. And I was like, well, no. And she was like, yes, you are. And she <laughs> said, I could actually use a freelancer to help me with some of my projects. And uh. I was like, I don't think I can do that. And she was like, Taryn, you don't work for them anymore. You work for yourself now. And it was a very transformative moment of realizing <laughs> I don't work for them anymore. I can make my own rules and I can I can do work for others. And so she sent me the contract and she also wound up hiring me to do some freelance work for her on a couple of other accounts. And so I started dabbling. I mean, at that point, I started 
if anyone wanted to hire me, I took them on because I was just astonished right. people wanted to hire me to do PR. And so at one point, I think I had 19 clients. Um, Whoa, and it was just yeah. me. And they were all over the board. You know, somebody wanted me to write their newsletter content and somebody else wanted me to help them with graphic design. And, you know, the benefit to the first job I had out of college being the in-house PR person is, is oftentimes when you're the in-house PR, it also means you're the in-house advertising, you're the in-house marketing, you're the in-house, right. you're, you're doing you're everything. everything. You're the all in one. Exactly. And so I learned how to do a little bit of everything. What, what happened with the firm is that I realized I really loved the earned media PR side of it. And I didn't love the other elements as much. And the things that would take me five minutes to do that would take others two hours to do was also true vice versa. You know, for yeah. me to create a graphic for somebody would take me five hours. That would probably take you six minutes. And so right. as time evolved, I realized, <laughs> you know, there are clients that make me really happy. There are clients and industries that don't make me, you know, excited to come to work every day. And that's yeah. where we really tried to make this intentional shift of being known in the Southeast as, as the travel PR firm that delivers real New York results, we like to say. Right. Because um, did you do that shift? Because that seemed to be like what you enjoyed? Or is it we were starting to pick up or you guys were starting to pick up a lot of clients in that in that category. We were still really heavy in fashion and beauty at that time. And, and it was it was starting to become about 50 50. But okay. the people in travel and hospitality, I mean, by definition, they are the most hospitable, happy, just they have fun. They are there to make others enjoy everything around them versus the fashion industry. Those people are often very cranky and they're very hungry. And I think they're cranky because they're hungry. And it just things in the fashion industry are so tense all the time. And people think the world is ending over a skirt and it's not. And it's yeah. just, I mean, very much the devil wears Prada is very true. Those experiences are real and that happens all the time. And it's just so stressful. And, and there was a really pivotal moment for me. There was one night that I was tracking a skirt, a sequin, beautiful skirt that was being mm -hmm. shipped from Hong Kong to New York to Vogue magazine. And I kept thinking, why is this skirt? And I was literally hitting refresh on my computer over and over and over again as I'm watching the skirt and nothing is obviously happening as I'm hitting refresh in real time. Right. But I'm tracking this skirt to make sure it's gonna get to Vogue by 9 a.m. for their run through. And my husband who was in medical school at the time came out and said to me, what are you doing? It's midnight, come to bed. And I was like, well, I'm tracking this skirt. And he was like, well, I have surgery in the morning. And it was one of those moments that you stop and think, is this really that important? <laughs> and, and really, why am I this stressed out? You know, it, it just, it was sort of a breaks moment for me that said, maybe there's more. <laughs> right. And maybe this isn't the end of the world that I think it is. And maybe it's just the environment that I'm in. And sure enough, you know, when I started getting more clients in, in the destination space and in the hotels and resorts, there are rarely days that there is anything that's, that's, dramatic, let alone yeah. the level of drama of not having a skirt by 9 a.m. Right, right. So let me add, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, the clients are obviously, you, you, like they're happy, they're hospitable, but you work with the media. Do you, were the journalists and the reporters, um, did they follow the same type of personality as the, as the industry that they cover? I think... There is definitely, yes, I would say that's a fair statement generally. Now, I will say like anyone that's based in New York has a higher level of intensity. They just do. They are yeah. at full throttle all the time. And honestly, I thrive in that environment. I'm from the Northeast originally. And so that speaks to me. I moved to New York because I wanted to be part of that pace. And it was actually a real challenge for me when I relocated to South Carolina to get into the mindset of yeah. if you call someone after 5 p.m., they might not answer their phone because they've left the office for the day. And right. um, It still baffles me. I came from, you know, Midwest, some, some bigger cities up there. And that was, that was a very hard culture shift as yes. well. Yeah, it took me a long time to get there. And, yeah. and so I do enjoy the pace of, of those New York reporters. And I think not necessarily just limited to the fashion industry, even, even the broadcast world, regardless of what industry they're in, the, those are intense 
people yeah. to work with. Those those journalists are going a thousand miles an hour, 24 hours a day. They don't stop. And so you've got to be able to keep up with them uh, and you've got to be able to kind of play their game. Wow. Um, so what's been the, so you, you were saying over a decade, I'm trying to think of like, so you, you've been in business for 15, 15 years. This is 15 years. Okay. Yeah. 15 years. Um, what's been, uh, your biggest, like, what's been the most rewarding part of starting your own company? That's a great question. I mean, I'm at a point now where I, I'm still in disbelief that I have that people actually come to me for advice. But really? you give I, such I, great I, advice. I, I still am trying to figure out how to run a business, but I do get asked a lot how to do this. And, and a lot of it is related to marketing and branding because again, I don't know why people are asking me, but some people seem to think that I did something right along the way. Right. And I'm always happy to talk to other people about it. And so for me, where, where I get the most joy on a regular basis is getting to talk to other small business owners and give them mm -hmm. advice. And anytime I have the opportunity to do that, I've, I don't think I've ever said no to somebody who said, you know, can you sit down with me for 30 minutes and just give me your time? I'm always willing and happy to do that for anyone. I just, I love being able to help others and kind of teach them mm -hmm. what I wish I knew and some of the pitfalls or where I see opportunity for their businesses that, that gives me actual joy that, that really fulfills me now. Um, where, so where else do you draw or where are you getting your inspiration? Who do you look up to um, as, you know, along your journey, whether it's 10 years ago or even today of, of, you know, are you sourcing it from other people? Are you listening to podcasts, books? Like where, where's your, where's that energy and that inspiration source? I am constantly reading and looking to learn more. Um, I probably try to catch 10 ish webinars a month. And then I have mm -hmm. the rest of my team for the ones that I can't listen to they're listening. And then every Monday we report to each other. We do little presentations to like the yeah. high level, like takeaways. Um, so I felt like that was really important. It's great if I learn something, but if I'm not sharing that with the team, then, then it stops and ends with me and, and vice versa. You know, if I'm having them attend something that I can't attend, I'd love for them. So we, we're all responsible for putting together just a very brief PowerPoint presentation that we share during our Monday meetings, but it works really well. I think, you know, to just make sure that we're all constantly learning because I think that's the most important thing. Um, yeah. I made it a point years ago to sign up for every trade publication and industry publication that I could find within kind of food and beverage and travel and hospitality, because I didn't speak the, the DMO language, if you will, the destination marketing right. organization language. I didn't, I didn't speak any of that when I started and it's all been learned. And, you know, I can now sit at the table with any DMO across the country and literally have full blown conversations with them about all of their data and know exactly what they're talking about. And that's all self-taught. That's all just because I'm constantly listening and paying attention and learning and looking for resources to learn more. And that's one of the first things that I tell kind of the up and comers is you can't fake your industries that you're in. If you really want to be in these industries, then you need to learn these industries. Right. Right. Or understand that, like we say that on um, the bright marketing side of you, you got to walk in their client shoes. And if you're not curious enough and up about their category, their language, their language of business, which is very unique to the you know clients, then it's going to be hard to serve. Yep. I'm Thanks a big friend. believer. Respect is earned. And if you want to earn your seat at the table and have them call and confide in you and ask you for your opinion on things, then you have to do the, the grunt work behind the scenes. That's not even part of what they hired you to do. And that's, that's right. probably for us, you know, our business model is very unique. We're a very small firm and very intentional about who we bring on as clients. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten to a place where we are not treated like the PR firm. We are every client treats us like we are an in-house C level with them walking right alongside with them. And, and they call us for things that aren't even PR related because they know how much we understand the entire industry and a much more holistic approach to what they're doing and how we, what we do plays into that. Hmm. So what do you think has um, surprised you the most, like ha either that's caught you off guard um, as you've grown your business the last 15 years? So I would say, you know, my biggest, the, the one night that I essentially cried myself to sleep 
I'm not a crier. I didn't cry when I had kids. I didn't cry on my wedding day. But the one night that I cried myself to sleep was the fashion company that I had. Um, mm -hmm. I had a three-year contract with them. And when the contract was up, they called me and they asked me if I was planning on moving back to New York. And I said, no. <laughs> and they, they said, okay, well, you know, I, I think we want to go with a New York firm at this point. Mm -hmm. And they were more than 50% of the business's income. And so despite the fact that I had more than a dozen clients at that point, they were still such a significant chunk of TKPR that I learned the single most valuable lesson of my career as an entrepreneur that day to never let one or client determine the success or failure right. you know, financially of your business. Because you, I learned then you have to get to a place where you could lose one, even two clients and have it not matter at all. And That's so right. that, that became a whole structural, sh that was a mindset shift. It changed everything as far as how we did business. It gave me that sort of freedom to let go a lot of those really small business clients again that I really cared about but that just I mean if they're if they're paying $500 a month that's not that's not a realistic not sustainable business. that's yeah. not that's you know just not realistic <laughs> right right it's interesting you know you know coming from the agency side uh, one of the agencies I work for you know that was that we had a a one of the local universities master's program come and do an audit. Um, uh, and that was some of the feedback that the, that those student that class did of you're in a danger zone. Um, you've got a client that even though it's multiple divisions of a client, it's still one brand or one company organization. That is, it was at the time it was like 80% of that agency's business. And they were, you've got to diversify. And it was interesting how they, came and structured and said, you've got to put everything, what they called in a, in a pyramid um, and map out of like, you need to have a couple of big players. You need to have a, you know, in the middle, so, you know, depending on the, the budget side, you know, but you need to have people in these like five levels. Um, but you got to hit like the upper pyramid part before you can really take on and fill your, the smaller businesses, um, to kind of help build that, you know, that make make your business healthy. So one, you're not uh, vulnerable if one leaves, yeah. and and you also allow like our the the agency's new business team to go. Oh, it became really clear where the gaps were. Of well, we have nobody at this level for these budgets. You know, these these budget we need to hit this part of the pyramid. Um, but yeah, those were, uh, we've, we've tried to model that, but it's hard. It's hard when you start getting in servicing accounts. Um, it's really hard. Firing clients is like the worst. I mean, because yeah. I mean, we've been really lucky. I mean, we've had clients that have been with me now for 12, 13 years. And I mean, they're the ones that got to stay. We had others that obviously we had to leave, but but it's really hard when you have a great relationship and you outgrow the client, you know, and, and yeah. you just, it's, it's business. You know, I constantly am reminding myself on a weekly basis. These are business decisions. These are not personal decisions. And you have to, it's hard to remove yourself sometimes from that because especially when you've known these people for years, but sometimes you do just outgrow them or sometimes they outgrow you. Right. Well, like you said, it's, you know, it's business. They are relationships, but I think if you have that rationale and um, they'll understand, because if they were in your shoes, they'd be doing the same thing. Yep, exactly. Um, and and yeah, I mean they're they're uncomfortable conversations, but they but they they have to <laughs> they have to happen because um, uh, you you operate a business, you feed yep. other people, you you know. And that those those time and money and resources and that energy, uh, it's got to go where where you need to go to grow, right? Um, so how what's been the most like other than letting go or or firing clients? What what, what other challenges have you faced trying to grow and scale your your company over the last decade? I think that, that so that strategic growth is always kind of there. You know, we have, a, like I said, a very strange business model. And so 
all of our clients, we don't, we don't worry about hours. We just, we worry about results. That's our, that our key thing. And so it's, it's whatever it takes to get to the results. And um, so we kind of have a way of evaluating potential new business and a potential client of whether or not they're ready for what we're about to do. Um, And so, you know, finding those right clients is hard. um, And we're constantly looking, you know, because with what we've found is, you know, the clients that we wind up signing, it's usually two years before we actually decide that we're going to move forward with them. And then even once we do, but what we do takes so much time that we're not. Yeah, you guys are working on calendars. At least a year out. So, I mean, a great example, we brought Southern Living um, into Macon during their Cherry Blossom Festival this past March, six months ago, and that'll be in print in six months. And so it's, we're in the long game here. And so the clients have to be understanding that what we do is, is a very long game and, you know, we're not going to be done in a year and we're not going to be done in two years. You know, this is going to be a really long process. And so, um, you know, I think that that's, that's probably the biggest challenge is just finding that right fit long-term client. That's not Mm -hmm. looking for a six month contract or, or that wants to try it out for a year, you know, and see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. I'm going to test you. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it's basically we're setting you up for failure and you're setting us up for failure, you know, and I'm very transparent about these things. I don't sugarcoat things. And I'm, I'm very, I'm quick to turn away clients. I'm very slow to take on new clients because I just, I want us to all be successful at the end. I don't want to have a a failure story. You know, I want every client to walk away and say, we did exactly what we told them we were going to do. So do you have kind of like your, like, um, shortcut or your vetting process mapped out like you already know okay if they if they say these things we're moving forward you know they've kind of passed the test but these things nope like yep. they, those are it used, be, it used to be in the first phone call if they asked if we could get them on Oprah. <laughs> that was my like, we're yeah. dead now. <laughs> Bye. Really? But that doesn't exist anymore. But we, I definitely have come to to know sort of the, the red flags and the barriers. Um, and I can kind of look at a hotel or a resort or a destination and either know they're ready for us or they, we've got a lot of work to do before they're ready for us. And I'll be very honest with them about what that process would look like or who else mm-hmm. we would have to engage to get them where they're, where they need to be. Um, you know, I, I think we get a lot of phone calls of, from people that like, we have to hire, we need you, we want you, we've heard all about you. And, and I have to give them a harsh reality of you're not ready for us, or you think you want what we do, but really you want marketing or really you need advertising. We are right. not the quick fix. Again, like we are not going to give you that fast direct ROI that you're looking for as the lifeline right. for your business. Because when I started a lot of the small businesses that were hiring us, what I realized is they were calling us as a lifeline. They thought we were going to suddenly like- You were going to save their business. business. You are going to get them so much PR. That's that it. Was gonna- and- And, you know, they'd be sitting around waiting for anything to hit, you know, calling every day. Is that story coming? Is that story coming? And and so that was one of my big flags to realize if we take on a client, they have to have a a robust marketing program. They have to have their own advertising program. They've got to have a social media director that has nothing to do with us. Like there are other pieces that we all have to work together on collectively, but we can only be one avenue. We are one piece of a much larger puzzle. And that's been the key to the success with the clients that we're working on. And so without, if they tell us that they don't have any of those other pieces in place, that's an automatic barrier for us. Wow. That's so, that that's fantastic. Um, and you're, so you're sitting down with them and you're going through all this. What's been their reaction? Like, I mean, I, some people literally still beg and plead. And I just, you know, I, I feel terrible because a lot of the calls we get are friends of friends or referrals. And yeah. I mean, I pr- honestly, we probably turn away about 40 pieces of potential new business a year before we like, I don't even do a proposal. Like it's after that first initial mm-hmm. inquiry. Just, that just I conversation. Tell, like we don't have to go any further here. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, I'd rather somebody be honest with me than, than stream me along and sugarcoat it and then take my money and not deliver. And so, you know, I just, if I'm not super excited about something right now, you, you don't want me involved. Like I want to be a thousand percent all in on every project that we do. And that's, again, a, a strange way that we've kind of structured the firm is that I do work 
on every single client that we have. And that's why we have such a low capacity for clients is because I want to be very involved. That's the part of this I enjoy. I don't enjoy running a business. I hate invoicing. I hate the accounting side of it. I, I hate the potential new business side of it. I love the PR and working on the big ideas and landing the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Today Show. That is what I love doing. And so for me, I've, I've got to love what it is that we are promoting. So would you consider that your big aha moment of really kind of understanding your strengths or and, and what drives you and what gets you out of bed? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. I, mean, I think my biggest aha moment was really realizing that I love these small businesses so much. I, I love them, but I, I the way that I can help them is literally just by giving them some of my time, you know, take 60 minutes of my time. I'm not going to charge you for it, but let me just give you some advice. And my God, if I were you, I would write down every damn word that comes out of my mouth because I promise you, I am giving you gold, but you yeah. have to then take it and run with it. I'm not going to do it for you, but I am giving you every tool that I have in that 60 minutes. I'm not giving you smoke and mirrors. I'm giving you real takeaways and right. it's free advice. Like, and that to me, was very transformative in figuring out we got to go after the bigger fish. We are capable of, of producing results that agents, most people assume that we have 20 people on our team. It always makes us laugh when people are like, so how many people do you have working with you guys now? And we're like three, there are three of yeah. us. So it just, I know we can, I know what we're capable of, but we had to realize where the business was going and where we were best suited with our time. No, that's great. So curious, Taryn, because I've heard some of the advice that you give. Top three things when you go, you know, sit down with a small business or a startup. What, what's the top three or five things you tell them? That's you like out everything they are doing from the rooftops. I, I, I met with a young lady um, who's a personal stylist and I've been watching her just even her Instagram, like, look, Instagram and social media are free. Like get on there and be posting yeah. every day. And yeah, there are ways to pay to play and do all that. But if you're not on there every single day as a small business owner posting something, you're missing like the greatest free opportunity that exists out there. And literally right. today I texted her and I was like, you should be doing this, this, and this. Like, just because like, I couldn't stand it anymore sitting here watching like nothing. Like I just, I, 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 can't help but get involved sometimes because I'm like, you're missing a huge opportunity. So that would be one. I mean, just shout everything that you're doing from the rooftops and then yeah. ask other people for help. Like, I'm not going to volunteer myself to you and say, hey, let me like have 60 minutes of your time to tell you what you're doing right. wrong with your business. But if you ask me, I'm not going to say no. The worst that somebody will do is say no, but you're not going to get things if you don't ask for them. And right. especially I have found in, in the small business community, people are willing to help other people succeed. If they're not willing to help them, they're jerks. And so yeah. <laughs> Carl will come back around and get them. But most people that are successful had somebody else that helped them be successful and they will That's remember right. that and they will give you their time. And, now, there, and I know. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say, sometimes I look at my calendar and I literally will tell somebody I can't get you on my calendar for three months, but they'll be on my calendar in three months. Like right. for sure, we will get it on the calendar and it's locked in. But so. yeah, I was, I was saying like most local communities are like that. I mean, we're based in the same community and I feel like it's very collaborative and um, people are very gracious with their time and their energy and their advice. But we've heard that from founders all over the country of find your community. Don't be afraid to ask for help. People don't know what you don't know. And sometimes you do have to kind of swallow maybe pride to admit I don't know something. Um, but there are there are people that will will give the advice if you ask for it. Yeah. I mean, a true story. A, a few years back, probably about it's been a while, but I was asked well, to yeah, do that. I was asked to be a director of the board of a, a food and wine festival here in our community. And I had to say to them, I'd love to, but I don't know how to read a profit and loss. Like I just sit there in the meetings and stare at it because I have no idea. And so they took me aside and they taught me how to read it. But like, 
I honestly, I was, I, I, I was flattered by the opportunity, but I had to be honest and say, like, I can't leave this group and have you know that I have no idea what I'm looking at when you hand out this paper every month. Like, I, it was just something I was never taught. I didn't need to know it. Right. And so I don't think there's any shame in asking for help when you don't know. I think the worst thing that you can do is pretend to know something that you don't know and just kind of shuffle papers around it. Um, but my third piece of advice is always getting involved in volunteering. And mm -hmm. I mean, to this day, I can single handedly trace all of TKPR's success back to the fact that one of the first things that I did when I moved to Greenville was volunteer for that same food and wine festival. Okay. I knew no one in, in this community. I didn't know a single person when we moved to South Carolina. Um, and I, I, on a chance encounter, met somebody who was on the board of directors and, and she said that they really needed help getting the word out about their festival. And I was like, well, that's what I do for a living. I'd love to help you guys. And, and so I volunteered pro bono. I did the PR for that festival without a, a dollar in payment for more than seven years. Um, and wow. then I wound up on the board myself. And but that led to so many clients for us that, and that was never the intention again, because when I started out, I was too green and, and not smart to realize any of the things that I were doing were actually smart business decisions. I just thought I, I was trying to meet people and make friends. I was, I was very, very green. But what happened was I started meeting people and they asked what I did and people on the board started telling people what I was doing for the festival and it all spiraled from there. And, and truly to this day, six degrees of separation, every single client we have, you could trace right back to that. Well, so yes, I mean, volunteer because it, it will do great things for you. Yeah. Does that festival start with an E? It sure does. Yeah. I was like, okay, I know I sat on the board for another festival in town. I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. But Yeah. I know which one you're talking about, and it's it's uh, nationally recognized. It's now a beast. It sure is. It is yeah. a, it's put Greenville on the map for sure. It sure has. Um, so okay, you you if you could hit rewind, what would you change about your business if you had to go back in hindsight? Someone gave me some good advice because I needed it a couple of years ago, and they said hire fast or I'm sorry, fire fast, hire slow. Yeah. And it took me a long time to, to get to a place. I always thought I was going to be a one man shop. And then probably about five, six years in is when I hired my first employee. Um, and then, you know, we kind of moved forward from there and um, I've made a couple of missteps along the way, let a couple of one employee in particular stay on longer than should have. Yeah, so I yeah. learned from that lesson and, I took that advice of as soon as those red flags start showing up, don't let it go on longer than you need to. Because honestly, the first time that I did it, I should have done it six months sooner. The second time I did it, I should have only done it a week sooner. I just didn't let it go on a second time because I knew from the first time from experience. Yeah. And that hiring slow is great advice too. I mean, we, I have two ladies who work for me now that are just incredible, outstanding. Like I, I would just... I don't know what I would do with either of them, without either of them. And it, both of them were long time coming in terms of hires. One of them I had known for years and we kept in touch. And she was very intentional about making sure that she stayed on my radar and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and then our, our second hire, same thing, our most recent hire, she just, you know, it, it was somebody that we took almost a year to fill that position because it, we had to find the right person and we had to wait for the right person to kind of come along. And right. And that's I, I, I have shared. Was this the, the position you were you were um, you've re recently filled that you put out on LinkedIn? Yes. Yes. So I have shared, I think, your advice and um, and story with several other founders and and I you know, told my team too. I, uh, and now we've adopted some of that. So tell like, yeah. when you guys went to LinkedIn, you gave specific instructions. We did. And so, I mean, PR, we're, we're, we're planning itineraries, we're booking flights, we're coordinating. I mean, we, we currently have a festival coming up that we have 12 different journalists they're each flying in from different parts of the country. They each need their own car service once they land here. They each have different itineraries for the weekend. They each have confirmation numbers for their hotel rooms. Like the amount of detail, detail. that goes into what we do is insane. And that's just one weekend out of, for one client out of the, so you can imagine the day-to-day -day right. of what our lives look like over here. And so in the job description, you know, I basically, I, I, it was a very brief job description, but it basically said attention to detail is a must. 
And then at the end of, of the post, we put, please email your resumes to my associate. We probably got, and we posted on LinkedIn. I thought, no problem. All right. We got close to a hundred resumes by clicking the button on LinkedIn that says apply now. I never looked at a single one of them because that wasn't part of the attention to detail that I needed because it specifically said in the instructions, email your resumes. So right. there could have been a hundred great candidates in there and I didn't look at a single one of them because to me, that's automatically like that was the greatest test that I didn't even realize I was giving, you know? And so we, we got less than a dozen emails out of a hundred other click to submit. We got less than a dozen emails um, for this position. And, and luckily, our, yeah, our the right one. star yeah. was one of those. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. Is After you told that story, like I said, I've, I, and I've heard from other um, founders and, and, and scale up companies that had, they were like, oh yeah, we adopted that, you know, other instructions or putting things like in your cover letter, use these um, terms at least three yeah. times. Someone else so just told it me. Was, yeah, it was like, yes. They're like, we needed, especially for attention to detail, or we just wanted people that paid attention and cared. Yep. And so they, you know, so it was fascinating. I'm like, okay, we need to adopt that. And we, and we started doing that um, for some of our recent, you know, interviews. And it's amazing that it does. It weeds out people of like, if they can't do this, we can't have them responsible for it. For it doesn't things. give me a lot of hope for the future. I'm not going it to, was, it was a really, oh, it was a very sad process for me to think this is what, this is where we're at. You know, yeah. it, it was just, but I've actually heard that same idea about putting specific words that saying, put this in your cover letter. Just yep. see, are they actually reading this at all? Or are they just clicking a button? Yeah. yeah. Or are you just getting a mass reply, you know, yep. apply, apply. Yep. Um, yep. And you're right. It's uh we, we've been given that same advice and, and we've tried to, that, you know, fire fast, hire slow. It's so hard. It really is. Um, and we've even adopted of, I don't know about you, Taryn, of, do you know, and like, we've recognized red flags within 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, That's all it took this last time, honestly. Like somebody, you know, they're not going to fit in and, but, and I, I, I'm, I would say I'm more shameful of, uh, I've let people ride, I've, you know, given more patience, yeah. um, than I probably should, but, uh, but yeah, it's, we're, we're, uh, as our team, it keeps reminding me, you need to be unapologetic. It's your business and you know what your business is, you know, the criteria, um, because those wrong people just bring everybody down. Yeah, it's business, right? It's not personal. Yeah. You know, I actually really like the person that I had to fire, but I'm not hanging out with that person on a Tuesday right. night. I, I'm, I need them to do the job that they were hired to do. That's right. That's right. So if you could pick uh, two things differently moving ahead, like if you could fast forward your business, what two things would you change? Hmm. Like, what would you like to see immediately? I would have a person that handled all of my invoicing for me. <laughs> I, would, I would definitely all not the be business, that person. Financial stuff. I would not be that person anymore. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I really, we're in a really good place with, with where the business is at. And if, if I'm doing this exact same thing, 10 years from now, then, then we did something right. You know, I, mm -hmm. you know, growth is not we're not trying to be exponential in, in terms of growth. And, you know, if I can just keep doing the same thing and not worry that AI is going to take my job and, uh, you know, not worry that journalism is going away. Cause that was a big thing 10 years ago that there was yeah. going to be no more magazines and nobody was reading media anymore. So, you know, I, I just, if I can just keep doing exactly what I'm doing, you know, then, then I win. That's good. Well, what keeps you up at night then? My children. <laughs> <laughs> It is hard to be a kid in 2023. It is so different than we were kids. I mean, it is. It oh, is. That is. That is not my job that keeps me up at night. That's for sure. Now, how old are your your kids? You have two, Here, right? I have two in second grade and third grade. And the amount of studying for tests and quizzes that they have to do, 
I mean, these kids, like we didn't have real grades until sixth grade, until middle school. And these kids, yeah, what was it like S it was satisfactory and, yes, and, and excellent and very good. No, these kids have letter grades, like legitimate, like, ugh. so they're, they're studying every single day after school. And then they've got all their extracurriculars. Cause now you've got to be a professional athlete by the time you're 12 too. So that's right. In other words, they're missing out. Yeah. Being, being a mom, I moonlight as a mom. And it's, that is what keeps me up at night. Yeah. Um, it's not easy. I've got, uh, I've got four, I've got one out of, off the payroll. She's just now adulting. Um, her first job out of college in, in New Jersey, uh, which she loves. And uh, and then I've got a son in college and I've got two kind of middle schoolers. Those are, those years are not, you're going to haven't entered those. I call it the, the asshole tween years. They, <laughs> they are, they are not fun. They're, I see glimpses you know, of they that. They the well. cute stage. Yep. I, I see glimpses of that. And I'm like, oh, buckle up. This is going to be awesome. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I miss the sex. Like, I miss those those elementary years. They were they were sweet and cute. <laughs> when they I talk about the sweet and cute kids. So I don't know what happened there. Yeah. I, again, I blame, I blame. YouTube and TikTok for all children's behavior at this point. My kids are not allowed on TikTok, but I not swear now. all uh, it just they are different kids than we were. That's all I can they, say. They are. I, I had a uh, started a jar for she's, you know, she's now in seventh grade, but she started watching what TikTok like sixth grade, fifth grade. It was a couple years ago. I didn't know what it, you know, I should have known what it was, but I it was so new coming up and she would keep going, mom, I heard this on TikTok. And then I'm like, what the hell are you watching? So we ban, you know, no more TikTok, whatever. But for a year, um, anytime she said, well, mom, I heard this on TikTok or I got, I would make her put money in a jar and it was the TikTok jar of, I don't want to hear that phrase. It's right? a good idea. I, I feel like I need, to the, I need to implement the anytime I have to say to my youngest child, you are not a YouTube star. You can't talk to me like that. Right. That She should have to pay me. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And that's like, and I know, you know, two years ago when she was like, well, that's what I'm going to be. You know, what, yeah. what do you want to do as a career? Well, I'm going to be a, a TikToker. And I'm like, no, <laughs> why does it exist? We are not doing that. And then I'm going, Oh crap! It now exists. It's a like, real, I know that's a real to. I know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I want to take back my answer to go. If I could do anything and go back in time, I think I'd be a travel influencer, and I'd be traveling yes. the world and getting paid to yeah. do it because those people have figured it out. They have. When yeah, when I look at those the the social media envy of man. I could have been a content yep. person traveling, describing food and hotels. That would have been, that would have been fun. Um, all right. I've got one last question for you. What would surprise me of things that I don't know about you or, or the listeners out there? What's something that would surprise people about you that I haven't asked or you don't get asked often? Yoga has probably been the best thing. I know. Oh, look, you literally did like oh, what? what? Yeah. So it was probably about 14 years ago that a friend of mine was like, you need to start doing yoga. Like you're going to give yourself a heart attack by the time you're 30. And I looked at her and I was like, I can't sit in a room and breathe for an hour. I don't have an hour to sit in a room. Are you insane? Like it was, I was so high strung and constantly going a million miles an hour and fresh out of New York and just still in that mindset. And I, so I was like, you know what, I'll try it. I'm willing to try anything. And I went to one class and sure enough, I was like sitting in a room breathing, thinking I'm wasting so much time. Like I could be doing so many other things right now. So then I tried one other studio and same thing. And I was like, this just isn't for me. And then I, I happened to just give one more place a try. And I found like the right yoga teacher, which people say all the time, like you have to find you the right and before I had kids, when I had a little bit more time, like I, I think at one point I was going like four or five days a week. And now I, I do it just twice a week. But it's mm -hmm. one hour that I just get to clear my mind and whatever else was going on. Like I completely tune out. I actually got to a place thanks to COVID. Um, we started practicing outside, which 
Uh, there are days that I don't even like, I don't even go to the mailbox. I'm literally at this desk. Like I joke all the time. I'm going to die at this desk because there are days that I get like 200 steps in because I'm at this desk all day long, I'm but with you. I get outside. I do yoga outside, which is just incredible. With a group or are you doing it now just by yourself? Now it's, now it's just me and the yoga teacher. For a while I was going to actual classes, but just from a scheduling standpoint, it's easier to just kind of do the one-on-ones. But I, I call them my yoga epiphanies. So the days that my mind really clears, I will get an idea and I'll have to actually look over at Laura and say, hey, can you text me this? Because I will forget by the time class is over. But I will just have like these great ideas. And they're usually always business related. But when my mind yeah. clears out, I have these great aha moments that honestly, they're my yoga epiphanies. And, and they, I've been having them for 14 it. years now. So yeah. You need to write them down, make a book. <laughs> they're only they're, they're like life epiphanies. They're really just like related to the client or like, hey, I should reach out to that person about this. But you never know. They could be they they could be good advice for other people. Well, what else do you do on your spare time other than yoga? What do you how that's do you about do? it? I mean, I'm trying to trying to raise two good little humans and give them as many life experiences as possible and take them to as many cool things that we can do with them and just give them a whole lot of really great memories. And that, oh, that's pretty it. much it. I'm assuming you, you are um, enjoying your clients products. Um, I will say we spent the summer on a KPR tour and um, we went to visit, I think, three or four of my clients properties and destinations over the summer. And it was awesome. I mean, the kids got to do it all and my husband got to come along. It was awesome. And it was really, I mean, it was work and play and both. And it was, it was just, yeah. it's great. Yes. Yes. We, we get to do a lot of really awesome things as a result of, of our. You, our I think you chose your category wisely. Yeah. <laughs> I would do that. So how do you want people to get a hold of you and to know more about TK, PR, and Taryn? How do you want so to we have a website that I'm actually really proud of. Um, and I even learned how to do those web updates at somewhere along the line, things that I didn't know how to do. <laughs> So running a business again, you never thought you'd have to know. So tkpublicrelations.com is our website. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Taryn Share. And um, begrudgingly, we also joined Instagram because my younger associates told me that we had to be on Instagram. So we are on Instagram as well. Um, Were you I'm personally or you just let the brand? Uh, just so the brand. Um, just the brand is on there. So, um, but my employees joke, like it's basically my personal page, even though everything is related to business, like people just assume it's me posting all the time. So, um, <laughs> but I'm pretty easy to find. So, and I'm always accessible and, and love to meet other business owners and chat. Well, I love it. Well, I appreciate you being on this. I just looked up the time. Like it always goes so fast. I say <laughs> this after every episode, but it does. I love these conversations and I appreciate you being on. I love Thank you for having you. me, JJ. You are welcome. Um, now for everyone listening or watching live, thank you for joining us. Again, this podcast will be uh, published this Sunday. Um, on all, it's available on all podcast platforms. So subscribe to Hello Chaos, comment or share, but most importantly, just listen to us and, and it helps us build a more connected entrepreneurial community. Uh, Hello Chaos, again, is one of the many resources brought to you by Orange Whip. Orange Whip is a multimedia company dedicated to serving founders and entrepreneurs in affiliate cities. We are 100% free. Just an email to join the community. And again, we're a one-stop content hub just for founders delivered in a weekly email every Sunday. We are currently in three cities, and that is Greenville, Columbia, and Charleston, South Carolina, with goals to expand to be in 30 cities in five years. So if you want us in your city, tell us to come in there. We'll do it. Um, this weekend, we'll be dropping a new edition that will be on founder mental health. Uh, very important um, because like most founders and Taryn is not, an, <laughs> we're all the example of we ride hard, we full throttle. It's hard for us to turn off. How do we balance um, and make sure that we, because uh, anxiety and suicide rate is extremely high for founders. So what do we do about that? Check out our edition. Um, great photography, great stories. And again, it's all free, just a subscription, just your email. Uh, find your city and enjoy. 
And if you'd like to be a guest on our podcast, you can send us an email at hello at orangewhip.com. And that's W-I-P. Y'all, thank you for tuning in to Hello Chaos. It's where AHA meets OSHIT. I'm again, I'm JJ, your host, and we will see you again next week.